G'day everyone, I'm your host Stephen, and welcome to another episode of the Bamboo History Podcast. If you remember from last week, we talked about the Kangxi Emperor, China's longest reigning emperor, and basically his military achievements early on in his reign. Today, we're on to part two of the Kangxi Emperor, and what his reign was like, and whether he faced any other problems towards the end of his reign. We're going to first talk about his reign in terms of his economic policies. Now, the Kangxi Emperor had very effective economic policies. One of his most famous economic policies was a policy called Geng Ming Tian, which was focused on the farmland of China. It was a really important policy that he enacted. The context of this policy was that during the transition from the Ming Dynasty to the Qing Dynasty, back in the mid-17th century, a lot of land in China, especially the farmland, had been owned by lords and aristocrats of the Ming Dynasty, and when they were defeated by the Qing, these were all confiscated by the Qing government. This meant that left a lot of land that was owned by the government, but not a lot of land owned by the common people, especially a lot of the Han Chinese peasants, who needed the land to farm and to survive. So without owning this land, a lot of these Chinese peasants had nothing to live off, and many were forced to work off other farms as tenant farmers, and they'd be subjugated to a lot of you know, unfair pay and less than average living conditions. Kangxi knew that because not a lot of people owned land, this lowered the morale of a lot of the people, and lower morale led to lower agricultural and economic productivity. So Kangxi enacted this policy of Geng Ming Tian, and the gist of the policy was that he distributed all the farmland that the government had owned back to the Han Chinese peasants for free for them to own, and lowered the taxes on these peasants, just so they could give them breathing space to, you know, set up the farm and, like, start producing. And this policy was so effective, because it boosted Kangxi's popularity amongst the Han Chinese. Many of these farmers were like, oh my goodness, thank you so much for giving us land and giving us a means to live. We bloody love you now! And this helped ease the tensions between the majority Han Chinese and their ruling Manchu overlords. As a result, by owning land as well, this boosted agricultural output and overall the Qing economy. So this was one of the most effective policies that the Kangxi Emperor had enacted during his reign. Now besides policies, Kangxi was a patron of Chinese arts and culture, especially arts and culture of the Han Chinese. Again, it goes to the fact that he's ruling a country where his own ethnicity is a minority, so he has to find ways to appease to the majority Han Chinese, so, you know, they don't rebel and overthrow him. So he was fully supportive of Han Chinese arts and culture. I'll give you some examples. So, most of the Mingshi, M-I-N-G-S-H-I, was compiled during the reign of Kangxi. The Mingshi, for those of you who don't know what that is, is the official historical text of the Ming Dynasty, the dynasty that preceded the Qing Dynasty. And it consists of 332 volumes. That's a large historical text. And it was Kangxi who compiled most of them. He also compiled a dictionary during his reign called the Kangxi Zidian, or known in English as the Kangxi Dictionary, which was published in the year 1716. This was a dictionary that extensively documented all the Chinese characters known at the time, over 47,000 Chinese characters, and it was one of the most comprehensive Chinese dictionaries up until the 20th century. So it held that record for 300 years. What a bloody achievement that was. In the year 1705, going back now from 1716, Kangxi also compiled the Quan Tang Shi, spelled Q-U-A-N-T-A-N-G-S-H-I. The Quan Tang Shi was a collection of 49,000 poems that was written during the Tang Dynasty. The Tang Dynasty, which was a thousand years prior to Kangxi's reign in the Qing Dynasty. As many Chinese enthusiasts will know these days, Tang Dynasty poems are an important part of ancient Chinese literature, and without Kangxi's efforts of compiling this, Quan Tang Shi collection, we may not have the access or knowledge to these famous poems today. So we've got to thank him for that. 
Kang Shi also did something that many emperors before him didn't do. He undertook several inspection tours to southern China personally. As you remember, southern China was, during his reign, the most volatile and resistant to Qing dynasty rule. He took a total of six tours during his long 61-year reign, as a bid to win support from the people of southern China, who, as I said, were very resistant to Qing dynasty rule, and still harboured a lot of sentiments and, I guess, a longing for the previous Ming dynasty and a day where their own people, the Han Chinese, would rule over them instead of an ethnic minority. These inspection tours that Kang Shi did had not been done properly since the Tang dynasty a thousand years ago. So yeah, he was being really busy and he was making a lot of effort to win the support of the masses. Kang Shi was a passionate supporter of Confucianism. You see, Confucianism, which is a Han Chinese belief and philosophy, so Kang Shi was aware, even from a young age, that Confucian scholars and intellectuals would be against Manchu rule. So it was important that Kang Shi win the favour of these Confucian scholars and intellectuals, because these people were the ones influencing the way of thought of the common people. As long as he could win favour from them, they would in turn influence the common people to, you know, love the emperor and love the Qing dynasty and the Manchus. So in the year 1670, when he was 16 years old, he issued a sacred edict to every citizen of the Qing Empire, and this edict contained Confucian principles on how to live one's life. And this edict had to be read at every town and village of the empire twice a month to teach the people the basic principles of Confucianism. For example, filial piety, which is be nice to your parents, and also to be generous to your family, and also to place high value on education, etc, etc. So by doing so, Kang Shi was able to win favour of the Confucian intellectuals and scholars, and by doing so, was able to win favour of the people's minds. Mind you, when he's 16, he's able to do things like that. When I was 16, I don't even remember what I was doing. And what about Kang Shi as a person, as an individual? Well, a reason why I think the Kangxi Emperor was able to rule China for so long and live so long was that he was a health freak. He was a big fan of eating lots of fruit and vegetables as opposed to meat. From my knowledge, most other emperors would usually consume meat because, you know, meat's tasty and I'm the bloody emperor, I can eat whatever I want, right? But no, Kangxi said it was important to eat fruit and vegetables, which gave him a very healthy and balanced diet. He also wasn't a huge fan of alcohol as well. He once was quoted saying, which means loosely that Kang Shi believed that alcohol had the ability to cloud a person's judgment and that alcohol caused diseases. So the fact that he didn't drink alcohol was also beneficial to his health. Kang Shi was known to be a very hard-working and diligent emperor, waking up very early, attending to government affairs and working well into the night but he was also known as being a very jovial and fun-loving emperor too. And a fun fact, he was actually the first Chinese emperor to ever eat chocolate. But apparently he he didn't like chocolate, and he said that uh, tea was better than chocolate. Yeah, so that was him as a person. He seems like a genuine nice guy, very intelligent, very smart, very hardworking, and a health freak. But being an emperor has a lot of challenges, and towards his later years, when he was about to die, he had a major succession crisis problem. Kang Shi was finally getting old, and he needed someone to take over when he died as the emperor. But who? Who could be the next emperor? He had 35 sons to choose from. To give you some background, how the Manchu people chose a successor was different to how a Han Chinese person chose a successor. How the Manchus chose the next emperor was that there would be a consultation between the emperor, members of the royal family, and high-ranking officials over who could be the most capable son to take over once the father died as the emperor. However, the Han Chinese tradition has always been primogeniture, which is, you just choose the older son to be the next emperor. So Kang Shi actually followed the Han Chinese tradition. He selected at the time his eldest son, Yin Reng, Y-I-N-R-E-N-G, as the successor, 
and when Yin Ren was one years old, he was made the crown prince in the year 1675. So Yin Ren was going to be the next emperor. Kang Xi invested in his growth and development a lot, to the point where he taught and mentored Yin Ren personally. Now, Yin Ren was initially great as a candidate to be the next emperor, but because the Kang Xi emperor had ruled for so long, he was basically like a Prince Charles. He was a crown prince for decades, and over time he grew a bit impatient. He was like, when am I going to be the emperor? How long does it take before my dad dies? Oh, shouldn't have thought that out loud. Ooh. And as he became impatient, he also became suspicious as well and more narrow-minded. For example, he was always worried that his brothers would try and compete against him and try and backstab him and, and take over as the successor to become the emperor. So over time, these feelings of impatience, suspicion, gradually made Yin Ren a self-centered and entitled piece of you can fill in the rest. And this behavior began to get on his father's nerves as well. Yin Ren often argued with Kang Shi, his father, a lot, and he didn't really care about his father's well-being. For example, whenever Kang Shi got sick away from home, he would never write to his father to ask him how it was going, even to the point that it was ignoring his father's letters altogether. He also created a little clique within the court between him and some other high-ranking officials, and that kind of made Kang Shi uncomfortable. You know, the fact that your own son's creating a little group with the possibility that they're going to scheme against you. So his father was really uncomfortable about that. And it was also said that Ying Ren was also cruel and mistreated his subordinates. So in the end, in the year 1712, after decades of being the crown prince, Kang Shi finally had enough and removed Ying Ren as the crown prince. So with Ying Ren gone, this gave the other brothers a shot at the throne. But who were the other candidates going to be? There were only two realistic candidates. The first one was the 14th son, Yin Ti, Yin Ti spelt Y-I-N-T-I. He was a strong contender. And he was a strong contender mainly because he had a lot of really successful military exploits. For example, he led the Qing armies to victory against the Mongols in northwestern China and Tibet, which were really big achievements at the time for the Kangxi Emperor. And this sort of capability was recognized by Kang Shi. And what the Kang Shi Emperor loved was because he was very young, he was the 14th son, he loved his youthful energy, and he was like, this guy could be the next emperor. But there was another candidate as well who could become emperor, and that was the fourth son, Yin Zhen, spelt Y I N Z H E N. Now, Yin Zhen wasn't as energetic, and he didn't have as much famous energy you know, military exploits and achievements like the 14th son, Yin Ti, he was a lot more reserved and he largely kept to himself. But he was still smart in his own way. How? For example, he distanced himself so he wasn't in the spotlight, so he was constantly in the shadows, which was effective because it didn't make him a target for his other brothers to put down. It's like tall poppy syndrome. You don't want to stick out, otherwise you're going to get cut. He also treated his brothers and his father really well, and this impressed Kang Shi. Remember, Kang Shi supported Confucian ideals, and it was really into that be nice to your family, be nice to your parents sort of thing. So that was, uh, that was brownie points for him. And Yin Zhen also had connections with some very powerful friends, and these friends would actually help him. So in the end, who became the successor? You guessed it, the fourth son, Yin Zhen. And how he named his successor, Yin Zhen, is still a mystery, because a few days before Kang Shi died, he gathered seven of his sons, and also this high-ranking official, and had his will read out. And that was when everyone found out that his successor would be Yin Zhen. And this succession crisis has always been a mystery, because some historians have claimed that Yin Zhen actually tampered with that will that was read out. But this mystery is a story on its own, and I'll explore this in a later episode. So yeah, in the year 1720, after 61 years on the throne, Kang Shi died at the age of 68, and he went up to the heavens and he started showing off his exploits to that gatekeeper. <laughs> he died of illness, and when he died, he was the longest reigning Chinese emperor in history. 
Yin Zhen succeeded Kangxi and became the next emperor, known in history as the Yongzheng Emperor. Yongzheng spelt Y-O-N-G-Z-H-E-N-G, and I'll talk about him as well in another episode. So what was Kangxi's legacy? Well, Kangxi will be best remembered as not just the longest reigning emperor, but one of the greatest of all time. He completed the Manchu's conquest of China and united China as one. He expanded China's territory to include Mongolia, both inner and outer Mongolia, as well as Tibet and Taiwan. He oversaw rapid economic growth and made China an agricultural powerhouse. He patroned the arts and literature. And his rule is said to have ushered in the Hai Qing era, which is known as the peak period of the Qing dynasty. <sighs> that was a long two-part episode. So, yeah, that's it. That's the end of the story of the Kangxi Emperor. I hope you all enjoyed this content. Before you go, do remember to subscribe to my podcast, follow my Instagram, and give me a rating on whatever platform you're listening to my podcast off. I really appreciate your support. And also, if you can spread the word of my podcast and leave me positive comments, that's also very good as well. If you've got any feedback, topic suggestions, or if you just want to have a chat to me, you can either DM me on my Instagram or email me. Details will be in my description box below. Okay, oh, my throat's getting a bit sore now because this was a very long recording. So I'm going to go and rest now. Thanks everyone for tuning in. Enjoy the rest of your day or evening. And I'll see you all next time on the Bamboo History Podcast. Bye for now.